June 5th, 1921. Dr. Kellis died this afternoon. The plain fact about Kellis is that he had worn himself out before the expedition started. After a very hard time mountaineering, he lost a stone in weight and allowed himself only four or five days to recuperate. He had diarrhea before we started and made nothing of it. But later, the trials of our first 10 days brought it on again and he had no strength to fight against it. He simply became weaker and weaker. You must consider his case altogether exceptional. Other people have suffered from diarrhea and got over it perfectly well. Everyone, in fact, has had it but myself. It has been a distressing business, as he was carried every day from Farry. We have been able to do very little for him. He was very shy about being seen in the act of retiring and insisted on starting after the rest of the party. On the first long stage from Fari, Bullock and I went out and met him and walked in the last mile or more with him in the dark. Yesterday, Kellas was in a state of collapse en route and Heron and I got him down to a shelter while Bullock went on and got Wollaston, who administered brandy. But except for such events, one scarcely saw Dr. Kellis as he went to bed the moment he came in and never had a meal with us. It seemed to me a very tragic end today, as none of us were with him when he died. His body is lying in a tent now, and we shall bury him tomorrow or the next day in sight of the three great mountains he ascended. At 8 a.m. on June 7th, we set out from Camp 3, Somerville, Crawford and I with 14 porters. I was following up the steps last on our rope, when at 1.50 I heard a noise not unlike an explosion of untamped gunpowder. I had never before been near an avalanche, but I knew the meaning of that noise as though I were accustomed to hear it every day. In a moment, I observed the snow's surface broken only a few yards away to the right and instinctively moved in that direction. And then I was moving downward. Somehow, I managed to turn out from the slope to avoid being pushed headlong and backward down it. For the briefest moment, my chances seemed good as I went quietly sliding down with the snow. Then the rope at my waist tightened and held me back. A wave of snow came over me. I supposed that the matter was settled. However, I thrust out my arms to keep them above the snow and tried to lift my back. When the movement stopped a few seconds later, I felt little pressure and found myself on the surface. The rope was still tight about my waist and I imagined that the porter tied on the next one must be deeply buried. But he quickly emerged no worse off than myself. Somerville and Crawford too were quite close to me and soon extricated themselves. Apparently their experiences were much the same as mine. And where were the porters, we asked. Looking down over the broken snow, we saw one group some distance below us. They pointed below them. The others were down there. The men were standing above a formidable drop. The others had been carried over. We found the ice cliff to be from 40 to 60 feet high. The crevasse below it was filled up with the avalanche snow and these signs enough to show us that the two missing parties of four and five were buried under it. At first, we entertained little hope of saving them. The fall alone must have killed the majority, and such was proven as we dug out the bodies. Two men were rescued alive and were subsequently found to have sustained no severe injuries. The remaining seven lost their lives. This has been a bad time altogether. I look back on tremendous efforts and exhaustion, and it is dismal looking out of a tent door and onto a world of snow and vanishing hopes. We made a very bad business of the descent. I was all right ahead, but Norton had a nasty slip and the porter's knot failed, causing him to fall down some way and was badly shaken. Meanwhile, I was below, trying to find the best way down. By some miscalculation, I thought I had prodded the snow around me, but walked into an obvious crevasse. All the result of mere exhaustion, no doubt. 
But the snow gave way and in I went with the snow tumbling all around me, down luckily only about ten feet before I fetched up half blind and breathless to find myself most precariously supported only by my ice axe somehow caught across the crevasse and still held in my right hand. Below was a very unpleasant black hole. I had some nasty moments before I got comfortably wedged and began to yell for help up through the round hole I had come through, where the blue sky showed. This because I was afraid any operations to extricate myself would bring down a lot more snow and perhaps worsen my situation. However, I soon grew tired of shouting. They hadn't seen me from above and bringing the snow down a little at a time, I made a hole out towards the side. After some climbing, I was able to extricate myself. Now I was on the wrong side of the crevasse and eventually had to cut across a nasty slope of very hard ice. The others took a better route and were down ten minutes before me. Racing against time to catch up to them at the end of such a day just about brought me to my limit. So much for that day.